the um, you know I'm I'm not a I I don't do web pages or, or websites. That's not my job. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that sort of thing. It's just not what I do. I'm doing other stuff. Uh, Reinhardt mentioned one of the other things I do. So, but I still have to. I still have to um, uh, control, you know, do some websites from time to time. It's just not my thing. And so I don't want to become an expert on one of these really complicated uh, web frameworks that give you a lot of power and that you can build a, a, a big e-commerce site with because there's just so many knobs and so many dials and so much that you have to remember I don't want to have to do that. I just want to, to, to take something and toss it in there, and it's going to work for me, regardless of what happens. And so uh, I looked around, and I couldn't find anything that would work for me on this. And so what do you do? You, you write your own. So I, I wrote this little uh, tickle application. that It is a web framework for writing simple web pages just as a utility. We're not trying to build e-commerce sites. We're not trying to compete against Facebook. It's uh, a simple little script that um, makes powerful and secure websites very easily. Someone mentioned um, the foundation story of Tickle. And it, it's about uh, you know, making things very simple. Um, uh, you know, John Oosterhoit developed Tickle because when he was doing this, this program called Magic, which was a VLSI design system, he was really frustrated with the doing the user interface part of it. And, you know, it was kind of hacked together and stuff. And after he says, well, you know, we need to make this easier. And so he developed Tickle for that. And so this is my attempt to do something like that for web interfaces. You might be interested, and I call this new thing WAP, which if you've followed my career, you know that I'm profoundly bad at picking project names. So, <laughs> more evidence to this, but I call it web, short for web applications. And you might be interested in this, this bit of code if you're like me and, and you, your primary job is doing something other than writing web pages. But every now and then you just need to, to do some sort of web page um, uh, for, for, to support your project. Um, or if maybe you just want to experiment with web technologies and you don't want to have to go through the learning curve of one of the big frameworks. Um, maybe you've got a big website and it's in a different framework, but you just, every now and then you need a little script to kind of glue things together or to put together a little small app for the office. Um, you can also use this to embed uh, a web technology in some other application. Uh, this tickle control. For example, if you wanted your espresso machine to be accessible via web interface, <laughs> this would be a great technology to use. And and furthermore, I, I wanted it to. Um, lately, the world has become much more focused on exploits and vulnerabilities. And so I wanted this to be kind of secure by default. So. The, the idea is that I want this to be very easy to learn, um, which means a very small API. Uh, the, 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 the interface to WAP is completely designed, is, it can be completely uh, described on a one-page cheat sheet. And the reason for this is, is that I, you know, I put together some web page, and then I don't work with it for two to five years. And then I have to come back to it and you know, make some modifications, and I don't, and I have to reteach myself how to do all this stuff. And I don't want to have to spend a lot of time relearning it. I want, I want to come up to speed quickly. Um, so WAP allows you to do, you know, the classic hello world and like six lines of tickle code, two of which are the uh, shebang and, and a package require. I'll show you an example in a second. Use this tickle shell 8.6. It really wants to use 8.7. It will be better with 8.7, but it will get by with 8.6. Uh, and you can use this to be up and running in five minutes or less. So what kind of web application? Oh, one of the key features is cross-platform. Uh, right now, when you develop a web application, the first thing you need to do is decide where you're going to run it. And everything is kind of 
builds off of that. And once you make the decision, you're kind of locked in. With WAP, you build an application, and if you just type tickle shell in the name of the application, it automatically pops up in a web browser on your desktop. It just pops right up. And so that's great for development. But then you want to deploy it, you can deploy it as a standalone server by giving it an option and giving it a TCP port. Or you can deploy it, uh, if you're like using Nginx as your web browser and it doesn't support CGI, you can do SCGI and give it a port. Or you can just make this script an executable file and put it in your CGI directory on your web server and it will just run. And you can do the same application in all these contexts. So that makes it really easy to debug because you can do it on your desktop. And then once you get it going like you want, you just S copy it over to your web server and away you go. Um, some examples of where we're using this right now. If you go to the SQLite website and you click on the search button, uh, you get a little search dialog box and you type in that. And this is all, you know, of course, the search is all driven by the full text search engine in SQLite. But we had to, to do some glue logic, and that, that's all done. And Tickle, of course. We've done that for years and years. It was originally like 353 lines of Tickle code. Uh, and we had to pull in bits of the uh, uh, Tickle Live stuff to decode the CGI parameters and all of that. And there were bugs. And there were vulnerabilities. Some people sent us some private emails. Said, hey, did you know that you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your search engine? And we had to patch that. And it was a big hassle. So um, I recoded it in WAP, and it's much shorter, it's easier to maintain, it's secure, and if we need to make fixes, they're much easier to make. And more importantly, I can test it on my desktop. I don't have to kind of test it on a live website, which is kind of dodgy when it is a live website. So um, that that's, that's one example. Another thing is... Um, with SQLite, uh, we're really big into testing, and so we have this, these uh, a big checklists that we follow for each release, and and we've got a a little web app that we use so that the different developers can check off uh, test progresses. It goes takes about three days to run through the entire testing process, but we've got a little che test uh, checklist application. It was originally written in 1,700 lines of C code and was all but impossible to maintain. So I rewrote it in 627 lines of WAP. Much, much easier to maintain. It has much more capabilities now. It, it, it didn't, it, before you had to refresh the page every time something changed. Now it kind of dynamically updates itself using the XML HTTP request interface. And now it's also cross-platform. You can run it on your desktop, whereas before it had to be on the website. Um, oh, skipped on the page. And it, the, the stupid little things. I mean, every now and then you just need a web page that's going to list a bunch of files. So over on the Fossil website, you know, the, we had a thing where you can look at Fossil and lots of different possible skins. And the way this is implemented is I have, you know, a bunch of files in a directory, a bunch of CGI's in a directory with the different skin options. And, you know, I could have manually edited the index file to put this all in. It's much easier to write a little short 28-line script that prints out the header, and then lists the files. And that way, if I want to add a new skin, I just add the new file, and it magically appears. And, and, and you know, every website has little pages like this that you want a quick little script, 20, 30, 40 lines of code. And WAP is really well suited for this. So what does the code look like? I'm not going to go into the details of how this works, because that's all described on the website. But here is your Hello World. Uh, I mean, you've got a shebang with the tickle shell, and I guess you could, there's a, a, a better way to do this where you do, you do shell and then do an exec or something. I, I, I always forget how to do that, so I don't worry about it. The, and then you uh, source in or package require the one file here. The whole thing is 994 lines of tickle code, last time I counted, and it <coughs> loads up in to less than 250 microseconds, so it's not, it's pretty efficient. And in this particular case, um, uh, what, what, you, what you do is, is you pr create a procedure for each web page that you want to, this application to uh, deliver. And, and in this case, I've got a single procedure called WAP default, and that's what runs if it can't find anything else to run. 
and it just prints hello world. And so I create that procedure right here. And when the procedure runs, it's WAP trim, which uh, outputs its argument as HTML. And then I start up the server right there. And if I put this in a file called hw. Or, hw.tickle for hello world and type tickle shell hw.hello world, it will pop up on your screen. Here's a more elaborate example to kind of illustrate what's going on. Uh, we source the script. Here's the default page here. This procedure generates a page that would be called, uh, oh, no, no, it would be called env. So to access that page, you would, you would add an env to the end of your URL. Um, and so when, when, when you access the web, this web page, it parses up the URL and, and, and takes that first name off the, of the first term of the path there on the URL and tries to find a WAP page procedure to do it. And if it doesn't find one, it does default. So this one uh, comes up here. It, it, it pulls out a CGI parameter, which is base URL and uh, does hello world. And, and right here you can see that we've done a percent HTML prints dollar, dollar B. And, and what that does is it expands the value of that variable, but it does it automatically escaping the things that are significant to HTML. So there's no chance of having an, a, um, an injection attack. Uh, and WAP trim, uh, just it's really kind of like puts. It just sends it to the web browser. But trim, it means that it, it chops off the excess white space on the margin. Because I don't know, I, if, if, you, if you're ever looking at a web page and you look at the, the HTML source and you see how you know, it's been generated by script and, and the source has got all this excess white space, that annoys me. I like all of my stuff to be marginalized, so I have WAP trim to do that. Uh, and then down here, we've got uh, a, a WAP environment, or the environment page. And all this does is, is it prints out the environment. And this is for debugging purposes. And I'll demonstrate that for you in a second. But it puts it in a loop, uh, asks for the parameters, and outputs each parameter. And, um, and then we start up the server. So it's very simple sorts of things. I, won't, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the details. Because that's on the, on the website, I just want to give you the concepts so that when you go to the website, you can kind of have an idea of where we're headed with this. So the input parameters to any web application come from four different sources. There are CGI variables. That's the, basically the, the HTTP, HTTP request parameters that, that came in have been decoded and stored as CGI values. There are query parameters and post parameters and cookies. These are the sources of information to your script. And with WAP, all of these go into a common namespace, which are accessed by these five procedures here. Uh, so CGI variables are things like the document root, the remote address, the user agent. There's a standard set of these, and all web applications use them. Uh, WAP adds a few extras which are defined on the website. So, for example, um, same origin uh, is set to 0 or 1, depending on whether or not the request came is, is from the same origin, which is a security concern. CGI variables are always all uppercase. Uh, query parameters are the things that occur after the question mark in the URL. And uh, WAP requires them to be lowercase. And the reason for this is all these parameters are in the same namespace. And we don't want an attacker to try and override a CGI variable by sending a query parameter. So all the variables are lowercase. And, you know, that really is not a, a big constraint. Um, normally, they're, they're automatically decoded, but, we, but the application doesn't decode the query parameters unless the HTTP request is coming from the same origin. Or if you want to allow people to manually enter query parameters, you can do WAP allow cross-origin parameters there, and it will decode them in that case. This is a security thing. Five years ago, nobody worried about this sort of thing, but now it's, it's a big issue. Um, 
every all the you know the the query parameters are automatically encoded, but uh, WAP decodes them for you automatically, so there's nothing to forget. You don't have to pull in special routines and remember to decode things. It's all automatic. Post parameters are when you do a, a form. Uh, they can be either the um, uh, form URL encoded or form data, so you can actually upload big files and so forth. Once again, they have to be all lowercase to, so that there's no impersonation of CGI parameters. And then finally, cookies uh, are automatically decoded and are available as names. And they are also must be all lower, lowercase. So the total API is contained in these, uh, looks like, nine and eight, 17 procedures. They're written with a minus sign rather than an underscore because you can type a minus sign without having to deal with the shift key, which is very important. Uh, and, and so this is, this is the cheat sheet, and if you kind of know these things, you can do the complete application. That's all you really need to know. Um, I won't go into it all. Um, a, little bit of, a little bit of background here versus, this can run as either a server or CGI. And it's not designed for high volume sites. If you're running this as a server, every web page is generated within the same process. So you can have multiple connections simultaneously, and it's using file events to kind of gather them. But once you get all the, the complete request, it stops and, and generates that whole page all at once. But, and everything else blocks while it's doing that. Normally, you know, that's a few milliseconds, it's not a big deal. But if, you had, if you're doing some kind of operation that takes a while, that would block other requests. Now that's with a server mode. With CGI, of course, every one of these runs in a separate process and so you can be computing concurrently. On the other hand, um, if you're running with a server, you can access global variables that are persist across multiple requests. CGI is running in its own process, its own sandbox, it doesn't do that. So there's a little bit of difference in the way this runs, depending on whether you're running it as CGI or as a server. Um, a well-designed app should not depend on that difference one way or the other. So just avoid global variables and avoid long-running um, procedures, and you should be good there. The other thing is um, this works fine with just plain old Tickle Shell, uh, or you know, I'm really excited to try it with vanilla Tickle Shell, but uh, I normally compile it into a WAP Tickle Shell, which is just Tickle, but I also build in um, SQLite because it turns out for these little small web pages, having SQLite at hand for storing some information is very useful. And it, it also builds the script in so that I can just do package require and it goes. And WAP Tickle Shell is statically linked, which is important to me because I run my websites in a sandbox. And I don't have access to all the shared libraries that things would normally require. Um, on the, the downside is, though, that I don't have um, all of the scripts built in. So I need to do this with vanilla Tickle Shell, I think, and then that would take care of that problem. Um, you know, it just, it, it, this really wants to run with Tickle 8.7 so that I can do reg sub with the minus command option. That's both faster and more secure. But if you don't have Tickle 8.7, there is a workaround, and it's automatic. It just doesn't work as well. So use 8.7. Yeah. Um, and so just to conclude, I've got some examples here that I'll try to run. And I originally wrote this slide that has some examples off the website. And I was thinking, why do I need to list all of these examples? Why can't I just do a little WAP script that... You know, as I add examples to the directory, they'll appear there. Um, so that's what it is. That's, that's the only URL you need to remember now. And that's, that's actually going to be a WAP script that's going to show you. Let me see if I can actually um, uh, run this for you. I don't know that this will work, but we will try it. What is this? Here we go. Can any, well, let's see what we can do here.
old demos. Here we go. So is that even readable from where you are? I can try and make it larger, perhaps. There we go. So that's, you know, it's a very simple thing. And if I click on, this is, this is you know, a page generated by a short little script. And the, the script, it allows you to, allows itself to be listed. So, um, you know, I've got some procedures here for a common header and a common footer, which I'll call. And then the default screen, um, well, I'm going to go a little bit smaller. There we go. The default page uh, is going off the top. You can't see it. All it does is it does, you know, it, it's looking for all the files in that directory. And if it's not a directory, if it's readable, it just outputs a line for that particular file and gives you a hyperlink to it. And, uh, you know, it's got a common header and a footer. And that's great. But down at the bottom, I've got another page, which is show yourself. You know, this is the self page. And you can see we're actually looking, if you can read that, we're actually looking at the self page now. And so this HTTP request ran this procedure right here. Um, we, we set a cache control. We started the header. We found the, the, the base location. Uh, we opened the name of the file that's running. And then we just uh, read it in. And then we output, uh, you know, a header. And then we output, and we put you know, percent HTML and the complete text. And, it, and of course, it escaped all of that text for you automatically using that mechanism. And then we also, with this particular page, I needed a style sheet. So I can just put the style sheet right here on a separate page. So it all goes into one file. It's neatly compact. It's very easy to edit and uh, control. Um, let's go back to... The main page. Earlier I showed you the environment. Here's, it, this is just listing out the environment that, that runs. These are all the CGI variables that are available to a, a, a web application. Some of them are unique to, um, most of these are all standard CGI variables, but there are a few that are unique to, to WAP that I've added, and you can read about those on the website. But the thing is, you can go up here and add, say, query parameters. I'm going to add, actually, a few terms to the end. And uh, then, uh, like that, and you can see, it took this query parameter, x, y, z, and now it's a variable that's available to us, and your scripts can access it very easily. Um, I added some extra terms onto the end of the script name, and they appeared right here. And so you have access to all of these parameters, and it just becomes a simple little tickle script. The, um, the whole thing is, is, is used quite a bit uh, for us internally. I, um, the website is here at... Uh, uh, wap.tickle.tk. Uh, it uh, contains complete documentation there, and you can read about the details there. Uh, again, the whole point of this is to keep things very, very simple. I would love for you to suggest improvements. People who suggest, can you add a new API, that will be looked upon with disfavor because we want to keep it simple. The goal is the complete API will fit on a single piece of paper so that I don't have to relearn this thing every time I want to uh, make an update to my, my web page. Um, that concludes my presentation of WAP. I don't know how much time I used or how much time I have left. But uh, we... Left. Well, that's great. We want to leave plenty of time for the coffee maker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> questions? Uh, just a moment, please. Talk the question with the microphone <laughs> for the recording. First question is, what uh, black magic do you use to support HTTPS? It's obviously not That's directly available in a plain TCLSH. Right, yeah, no. Um, uh, for HTTPS, you would, you would put this behind a regular web server and let the web server decode it for you. So the, the modes where you're running as a standalone server, that doesn't support that. 
So that would be a separate wrapper that you'd, you'd put on the outside. And so for my website, I mean, this is HTTPS, of course, and, and it's my web server does that decoding because I'm running this as CGI. And then when I'm running it locally and developing, I don't care about encryption then, right? Uh, okay, and the second question is about the HTML... Um, uh, escaping? Uh, escaping, yes. yes. Because, uh, well, it's, uh, I think everyone knows that the escaping usually depends on the context where I insert something. If I insert something into a double-quoted... Right. Drink, so yeah, I need a completely different escaping rule than elsewhere. I've got... You, I showed you percent HTML. You can also do percent uh, JS for JavaScript and percent string for other things and percent URL for escaping a URL. So there's different ways to escape depending on what you want to do. Thanks. Yes. More questions? Sorry. Um, how big a project would it be to make this work under Navi Server, AOL Server? Have you looked at that at all? I have no idea. I mean, AOL Server supports CGI, right? Yes. It's a no-op. You just plop this thing into there, into the CGI well, directory. The reason I, I was asking is I've got situations where I'd want the same script to run locally on something slow yeah. and then scale it up to a server where Navi servers, AOL server is quite fast. I wouldn't want to run it in the CGI there. But if you don't know, then it's a... I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I really focused on keeping it simple as mm -hmm. opposed to making it go really fast for heavy loads. I mean, this handles you know, dozens of requests per second without any trouble. Okay. 100 requests per second without any trouble. Um, but yeah, we're not going to Facebook scale. That's not the goal here. <laughs> uh, my issue would be that a lot of my pages would have blocking stuff in them and so would have to, at mm. scale, run multi-threaded. Um, okay. So I'd okay. have to move them to You could do that. Or do, or you don't want to run it as CGI, though? I don't know. I have this revulsion to CGI. Why? I just, I don't know. Uh, efficiency, obsession with efficiency, I guess. <laughs> um, it takes... 250 microseconds to spin up, you know, I mean, it doesn't take that long, so, okay. yeah. I already, I was a little bit curious, I was already uh, creating some application, which is an executable, which is an SDL viewer. Yeah. I have it on my screen, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right format to present, to show. Uh, I think we might have time constraints here. I want to see it, definitely. Yeah, but then later on. Yeah, maybe later on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question would be, you mentioned that the uh, post parameter is used to, uh, can be used to upload big files. Yes, it can. I've got a demo of that over here, okay. by the way. Yeah. Um, so, for uh, the, example... The file does not need to be necessarily on the same uh, uh, node, on the, on the same IP address. It could so be somewhere. Well, it needs to be on your, you know, your local. Here, I'm going to see if I can upload a file or something. Uh, what file can I upload? Um, is there an image or something here? Videos, talks. I don't know what I have on this machine. <coughs> Temp. I'm running over time, aren't I? You're going to kick me off. I'm going to get kicked off in just a second. Here's a GIF. I don't know what this GIF says. We'll find out. I'm going to do that, upload it, I'm, I'm, and, and submit it. And... There it is. It uploaded some GIF. I don't know what that GIF is about, but it uploaded it and, and put it in, and embedded it in the website. And you can and and it show the script that generated this page. So you can study this and see how I actually did it. Um, it's not that much code. Okay. Are we done? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> First talk, and we're already running behind. That's great. <laughs> One minute left. Uh, th thanks for this very nice presentation. Um, my question um, was very similar to your question, so it's already been partly answered. And I wanted to ask, um, I, I see one thing here, and that is scalability. Oh, yeah, hold, hold the mic closer to okay. you. Okay, scalability. Um, how well um, will this scale? How, did you investigate this, the issue of scalability? Well, I mean, it works well enough for me. We get uh, uh, 50,000, or no, uh, 50,000 unique visitors, about a, a half a million uh, HTTP requests per day on the SQLite website. And this doesn't run on every request, obviously, but it's used a lot. And so that's, you know, we're getting one request every, or six or seven requests per second around the clock. 
and this sort of thing works fine in that environment. Now, a lot of the requests are going to be static pages and stuff, but this still is in the mix, and it's not slowing things down. It's not even... Sh in fact, these sorts of scripts don't even show up in the budget. The things that really take time are, are when people uh, request custom uh, uh, tar balls that are five megabytes, and I have to pull those together. It spends most of its time compressing the tar ball. And, and so this, this is not a, a load factor on our website. Of course, depending on what you're doing, your mileage could vary. But uh, for me, it, it scales fine. And this is all this is running on a, a, a small Linode. Uh, it's, not, it's not a big machine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We, we already had this question before about the threaded and Navi server. Yeah. How well this will work together. So I will ask it again. <laughs> Thanks. We can talk about it later. Over cappuccino. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so next up is Jan. Thank you, Jan.